my main topic. Um, just a few thoughts of Lowland, uh, considering Lowland sequences generally, touching on a few themes perhaps that Alison initiated, um, and just generally, and also in terms of the world of post-Brexit politics. Um, this is Mucking, which we published last year, which in its time was Europe's biggest prehistoric and Roman everything excavation. Um, and the important thing about it is the nature of continental contact. And it's clear that some, a lot of the DNA work makes us start to rethink this, also think of traditional artifact studies in a new way. Because the critical thing about mocking, you can see its location on the gateway of the Thames. And if you could see far enough from mocking, you would actually see Maastricht. There is literally nothing between you um, and the lower Rhineland whatsoever. And which one? And this is very much reflected in its sequence. Now, the statistics on a site like this to sort of roll off of your tongue, it was so huge. They had 5,000 people dig here over 12 years, 140 roundhouses, 800 graves, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes on and on. Um, but I think for the intensity of land use on a number of our lowland, our big lowland excavations, I think it's really crucial that we elucidate and articulate the long term. And it's one of the, we have the potential because of the intensity of the settlement sequences in the lowlands. And here it's particularly important because, you know, if you look at mucking in the long term, you would see that, yes, now we would know the likelihood of beaker contact, it's got barbed wire beaker, but we know in the late Bronze Age with the two ring works, the metal work, and also the pottery direct connections with France, by the time you get to the late Iron Age, we argue that it's basically a trading depot um, that has direct con connections to the Champagne district, along comes the Romans, and then the Saxons. And this has amongst the earliest Saxon <coughs> occupation now in the country, we know it's there by the late fourth. So it's very much a charting of the comings and goings, and which is obviously crucial given its situation. And I would hasten to add, this is in the heartland of Essex, which was where UKIP came from, <laughs> and it's the heartland of the outvote. And it's an important perspective we bring to bear in terms of the, the, the area of the local past. And in some ways, the same issues come up also now as we get closer to the Cambridges landscape. This, this book will be out next year. And Trompington is just south of Cambridge. And it's one of these terrifically British village landscapes. Um, and they write books like this, The Common Stream, which is all about the nature, their presumed long-term continuities, the nature of village origins. Um, and the archaeological record upsets it something terribly. And we have exactly the same type of thing. The main emphasis here was the excavation of the Neolithic Barrows, the early Iron Age settlement, and then the Saxon. Um, but in the midst of it comes this, one of the, the a Dutch couple, as we now know from Wright's study. <laughs> I thought I would show some, some locals that showing up just south of Cambridge. They're, they're very much featuring in that. Um, and extremely important, get the sense of interruption. But it's clear that it's something in, you know, this idea of indigenous communities, this is incredibly upsetting in terms of their sense of their self. And we are adding a new dimension because they see the heartland of the English village going back endlessly in time. Now, the other thing that's quite interesting in terms of this study is also just to touch on the issue of settlement evolution. The excavations we've been just touching on are here, but it's the results that we're finding just in on the inland because we've now suddenly started getting these hugely developed Middle Bronze Age farmsteads, vast amounts of fine assemblages, um, incredibly important, um, and something because previously, Middle Bronze Age in the area has all been open settlement. In this case, we know we're getting the same type of pottery coming up as in Essex. So it means if you think of a landscape like this in the long term, what you're seeing is sort of various visitation landscapes earlier, and tasscapes. But come the Middle Bronze Age, you have enclosed settlement. Come the Late Bronze Age and the Early Iron Age, you have open settlement with no enclosure. Come the Middle Iron Age, you get enclosed settlement again. And also for the Late Iron Age, long come the Romans, villa landscape. Then you go to the Early Saxon land landscape, open settlement. Middle Saxon starts getting enclosed, Late Saxon, village origins. This sort of incredible oscillation this is not settlement evolution. There's just no way it is. It's not what we're charting. It's not what we're documenting. We're documenting something else. We don't have the language yet, but I think the indications are beginning to suggest a lot of it is about 
comings and goings and landscape. And I think that's going to be very challenging for a lot of communities. Right, now to move on to the main topic, which is going to be to look at uh, moving north of Cambridge, near here into the Fenland Basin. This is the area we're going to be looking at, uh, very equivalent, for example, to the, the Dutch sequence. It's in effect Britain's inland North Sea, the area in blue looking at the marine inundation sequence, which we have from the, the later Neolithic onwards, along to the, the Middle Bronze Age, essentially, causing with it a backing up of the river systems. So behind with the river systems, backing up the creation of freshwater uh, marshland. So a very dynamic period of environmental change has huge local ramifications in terms of the landscape. Um, on this map, Cambridge would be about here, Ely's here. This simply takes the time chart, the loss of dryland over the course of later prehistory, which is a 60% loss in land. Now that has enormous implications in terms of settlement structure. And one of the things we've been trying to model is how do people react in terms of this kind of level of environmental change? Um, is it a matter of a steady state retreat? Do people move further and further as the waters and the marshland rises, do they move up into the local, uh, higher up in, into the drier lands? Or are people, so in effect, are people like animals? Or are people like birds? Can people jump? Do they decide a landscape's had it? My grandfather saw it declining, and uh, you know, this is having, and I've heard of this really good place over here called Fengate, and we're going over there. Because I think that's an important dynamic that people have the capacity for long distance movement in the face of environmental change. So arguably, I think that's one of the issues we need to be addressing. We're just now going to touch on some of our major excavations in the River Ooze, again, north of Cambridge. First, looking at some of the data, a bit of the data from the Haddenham Project, which I did with Hotter in the 80s. And then for the last 25 years, we've been working in this landscape. The main site we'll just touch on is one that was dug by Mark here on the Godwin Ridge. Okay, so just to give a sense of map location. And what's interesting in this lands, in these landscapes, is this issue of, in terms of, because it does seem people are basically in the early Iron Age coming, colonizing the landscape. And that's where we reference our version of the Ascendelver model. Because I still find that a useful model, that idea of how do you come into land? How do you scout out and decide to permanently settle? And then also once they're inland, how are they using how are they using it? In this case, it's very interesting. In the Middle Iron Age, it's clear that they're using the tops of Bronze Age barrows as procurement stations. They're camping on the barrow tops to get marshland resources. The main site that we dug in 1981-1982 is Haddenham 5, and it's still largely unique in Fenland archaeology. Probably in terms of the Fenland, there must be something in the area of 35 Iron Age settlements that have been dug since. And only two of them have evidence of extensive uh, marshland resourcing, and nothing really compared quite to Haddam. And that's very interesting and challenging in terms of thinking of, of knowledge sets. Why do you get such specialization? The site's up here. This is a giant freshwater lake, willing a mirror that's forming in the late Bronze Age. But it basically, the settlement from a mixed farming basis, they're fully practicing mixed farming, is a Hudson Bay trading post. There was something like 600 beavers being represented, a huge array of birds being represented from del extinct Dalmatian pelican to swans to crane. A lot of the birds, they're obviously taken for feathers um, and then feeding the meat to, the, to their dogs. But I mean, it's, it, it's really, really quite distinct. And in our landscape, and here we get down to the Godwin Ridge site, we've only, after 25 years, only have one prehistoric site that is in any way equivalent. And this is a, basically a ritual platform stuck at the end of this, this Pleistocene ridge with all kinds of cut up human remains. And then in the base of the platform, four butchered horses, but then they're also sacrificing birds big time. Um, this is just to show an equivalence of the scale. Here's a coot, here's a sheep, and there's a Dalmatian pelican. Um, and basically, a Dalmatian pelican is the size of a sheep when it comes to sacrifice, and I think that's quite important. And this is extremely interesting because, of this, again, we're dealing with hundreds of birds coming off of, of this platform site. Um, arguably to read the entrails, uh, because then on Roman shrines later in the area, we're getting the same thing, that the Romans are clearly taking birds big time. 
Um, in a domestic context in the Middle Iron Age, they're not on the domestic side itself. They're not using the walled species in ritual context, but only on this platform site, which is somewhat contradictory. And the other thing that's interesting is in, like when you get people writing, wanting now to write the history of the Fenland, there's a presumption now based on Haddon and Fife that's saying that, oh, then wet resource, wild marshland resourcing was so important. Well, the extraordinary thing is there's no continuity of it afterwards. You know, we've done massive amount of Roman also. No, on none of the early Roman settlements do you get any marshland uh, exploitation, even though we know the marshes are sitting there. It's only in the late Roman period where you get a lot of diversification of resourcing that they pick up again in terms of using wetland resourcing. Now, to move on to slightly going further north, our data is a little similar to what they have on the Ouse, Aus, in that what we're finding is inland settlement off of the river valleys, the main colonization horizon, when they stop a matter of just visitation out of the river valleys, but permanent settlement is in the Middle Bronze Age. And paramount to that is the invention of the pit well. Because you don't really get these big wells earlier, and without the pit well, you don't get uh, permanent water resourcing. And that really uh, is essential, because otherwise you're stuck with spring lines. Just an example, so in this inland Middle Bronze Age, one of the things we've been getting, we've had on this site, is uh, necklaces of freshwater oyster shell. Now, complementing that, if one moves up to the Peterborough area, so we start thinking about the landscape of Flight Fen, Lots of excavations of Middle Bronze Age settlements, you can see that all the dots there. The red ones are the ones that have salt production evidence. Because here's the distribution here, that they're at, in Britain's inland sea. Um, so obviously getting major exploitation in terms of salt production. What is interesting is how few, there's only really been this one site in Langtoft where we're getting significant use of marine resourcing. In terms of sea mussels, we're getting cockles, whelks, etc. And also we're getting represented in the cremations. You're getting bits of marine shell mixed into it, uh, to it. And so the same thing, we're getting cockle shell necklaces, fairly large dumps of boat. We get the marine snail, arguably the gathering seaweed. Um, but it's very specific. There have been lots of other excavations in the area and they're not getting this kind of evidence at all. And that's really very, very interesting in terms of the specificity of it. So it's really just presuming that we can't presume a kind of just because a resource is there it doesn't mean everybody's using it. And especially for issues like hunting and fowling, does everybody have the knowledge skill sets? Now, in this case, this is the site of Thorny at Pote Hall, just west of Peterborough. I'm getting exactly the same thing. We're getting the, the cockle shell necklaces coming in. So it's a very nice idea that people are wearing environment, I think, you know, and then when they're on the inland, they're wearing freshwater mussel shells. When they're at the seaside, they're wearing seashells. It's not a big deal, but it's a nice example. We've got one really nice burial out here associated with a food vessel, and it's a child burial that has a limpet shell associated with it. And this is a nice example because it's drilled again. And limpets are not, the, the western fed edge when it was the seashore is gonna be a sandy shore. It's not gonna be rocky. Limpets you're only gonna get off of a rocky shore, which the nearest, the closest example to it is exactly the other side of the fen up at Hudstanton. And that's where sea hinge is. And it's great, the, the great inverted oak trunk set, in, set into the palisaded circle. Um, we've also known we've got Sea Hinge too. There's also clearly a lot there. It suggests to me that Sea Hinge as a ritual center is actually quite important. It's been underestimated. It's, I don't think we're talking about the, the Argonauts of the Fenland here, to quote Malinowski, but it is nice the sense of the distant use and referencing in terms of, of seashells in this case. Now really, just to conclude up a bit, the, um, the issue of when you get the, particularly things like the salt production sites, it's a bit like the same issues that come up in terms of the tin. We know it's a mass production. Along with wells, it's really important. It, for, you know, it means that every time you slaughter an animal, it doesn't have to be a feast. You, know, you can start doing different things with storage once you take off with the salt production. None of the Middle Bronze Age sites we're seeing it in terms of salt production. Are they in any way distinguished? In return for trading in salt, they're not clearly getting anything significant. It raises some quite interesting ideas because sitting in the heart of it all is the Flag Fenon Basin. And in this case, Flag Fen itself and also now Must Farm, which slightly raises the question of whom, and we also know this is a major area for sword production. 
So may, we may well be seeing sort of somewhat more major uh, centralization in terms of the exchange of salt. The last thing I'll just conclude with, which is more than anything is a throwaway thought, but I think it's interesting in terms of the lowland. You probably can't see it, but I'm presuming you all saw pictures, more pictures of Must Farm than you were sick of. Um, <laughs> there is its palisade. Now, a few years ago, I would, you know, I'd sort of half written a paper on flight fen as such an incredible environmental want, a waste environment, you know, to cut down thousands and thousands of trees in the name of building this timber platform seemed to me really quite environmentally wanted. And uh, it's the same. We, we published a, a thing, last, I think it was last year, in Prehistoric Society on the kill off of oryx in the Middle Bronze Age. Because you can't take the Middle Bronze Age and just see them all like as Americans. You know, very expansive land use, moving in, moving out, and doing. But I think the thing that is becoming interesting now in the light of Must Farm and its expansive use of timber, but we've just finished this year recently at, um, back at the Flight Fen Power Station site where Francis had the origin of his causeway. Uh, a very nice early Bronze Age site. site uh, nice timber revetted barrow set within a fence line. And the one thing you realize out of it is as opposed to saying that something like Flight Fen in its great chopping down of trees is totally environmentally wanton, which it may be, is the degree of how important coppice timbering is behind lowland land use. And that it is a kind of prehistoric good news story. Because it is clear they got that right. You know, they knew how to manage woodland. Um, you know, that site I showed you with the freshwater mussels, that had three axe halves in it. You know, in terms of an, all of different sizes, they've obviously clearly got tool kits galore. And they clearly are managing woodland very, very extensively. And if you think that, what an advantage that is in terms, if you take the old kind of gross Cyril Fox distinction between hot upland lowland, because it's something you're not going to get on acidy soils. And you see it, for example, on Christian's two project. You know, some of you presumably have seen that where they've got the, they've got the preserved wood for the house and they're using driftwood for the house. It's because when that heathland gets cut down, it gets cut down and it's gone and you've lost wood and resource. Where is in these kind of landscapes we're dealing with, you know, if you can keep your cattle off the browse when you cut down the woodland, you basically have coppice. And that is such a long-term advantage. I think that's an extremely important thing to look at. So I just want to conclude by saying, you know, emphasizing that, you know, on one hand, we can't in terms of our lowlands, because of the intensity of sequence of use, being presuming any longer continuities. And this way, I think the kind of data that Reich's being producing is challenging. It's going to take a lot of thinking. but certainly in southern Britain, the degree of long-term connection with the continent is quite imperative, and you are seeing a lot of movement and coming and going. You can't presume long-term continuities. But at the same way, it is also important to realize that access to wetland resourcing and access to, uh, for whatever reason, it really doesn't seem like things like how you exploit marshlands on a significant scale is actually quite specialized. And they were talking about knowledge sets um, which not everybody seems to have had access to. Right, that's me.